Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I am Ray, your ever so humble host. Uh, this week, we'll be reviewing some, well, I won't say classic because I'm doing nothing. I'm not doing anything classic. I'm doing all up to date, modern, recent stuff uh, that you should enjoy. So I hope you enjoy the show. Let's get started on it right away, shall we? Okay, so the next book this week is Chaos Rising the Realms, book six. Uh, it's an epic lit RPG series. And I mean epic. I mean, this is really a great series. I love this. I mean, there's, there's a few series out there that I can say I, I have had like seven books in or six books in. And I think they're they're not only as good as the first issue or first first issue. The first book, the first novel, they get better. So like book three is better than one. Book five is better than three. And book six is better than all of them. Um, I really enjoyed this. It's written by C.M. Carney. Narrated by Armin Taylor, and it's got a book length of 12 hours and 25 minutes. Soon, the two ships were close enough for their crews to see each other, and Lex's heart sunk. They were outnumbered at least ten to one, even if you included Steve the Blart, who'd scampered below deck at the first sign of trouble. Great chaos, pirates, Simon mumbled, his gaze moving up and down the line of oddly dressed enemies. They look more like bad cosplayers at a third-rate horror con, Lex countered. Did you say horror? A large, three-armed man asked. Cause me and the boys here love us some horror, and terror, and screaming, and all them accompanying bits. No, no, Lex said. I said honor, as in, it is an honor to meet you... Lex left his question hanging, giving the Chaos Fiend the time to tell them his name. So, w- once again, we go to the realms with Carney, and, and, and once again, he pulls out the rug from under us. I mean, it's just, it, he is a cold-blooded writer. I mean, I don't know where he, he, he just sits in his back room and just, uh, I'll get him with this, yeah! You know, he, he, he cracks me up because he really, really knows how to manipulate the reader. Um, if you've read the last book, and if you haven't, I have to ask, why not? Um, you'll recall that the series protagonist, Griff, uh, great character, love the character, um, vanished like Thanos' snap had traversed the realms and eliminated the hero altogether. Griff was forcibly logged out from the realms and sent back to Earth. Okay? So he's no longer Griff. He's just regular guy again. Okay? Um, that's really crappy for Griff, but it's horrible for everybody else. Because this leaves everything that needs to be done up to the rest of the Griff groupies. And they need to do what they can to defend the realms while they search for the errant Griff. And who gets put in charge? Why? Who? Who? Lex! Lex, the ever-mouthy NPC who can't seem to keep in contact with his player for more than a few minutes at a time without being separated from him. I mean, I, I don't I don't think I've ever seen like an uh, an NPC that's that's sidled with uh, having a, a player lose their player so much as anywhere in any other novel or any other book or any other series as I have here. Poor Lex just cannot keep his eye on Griff for a minute. I mean, they can't that you can't leave him alone because it's all done. Um, and if you recall, Lex lost Griff at the beginning of the first novel. Like, the minute that, that Griff went into the realms, Lex was gone. He, he was stuck. Uh, and he ended up getting stuck in a time loop until he could figure out a way to get back. So, there was some things happening there. Um, the reunion, once they got Lex got out of the time loop, was short-lived. Now, R- Lex is a reluctant hero, and, and he would love for anybody else to become the group leader. But he is forced most unwillingly to shoulder the responsibilities. Now, I don't want to go into a lot of details because, again, spoilers, and I try to keep that maintained to a minimum. But this, this really, this search leads Lex, Erat, and Vaughn um, to some unexpected places, and you know, as they're looking, and they suddenly find themselves at odds with the Lords of Chaos. Or are they the princes? I mean, I know one's a woman, so princess is out. But that also disqualifies lords. So anyway, you get the point. These are the embodiments of chaos, and they're pushing their way not only into the realm itself, 
but also towards Earth. Yeah, yeah, things are looking really bad for our crew. Now, the only thing I thought that he was going to do, but it but didn't, was hit Lex with Chaos Lightning, which would have made for a major turn of events in Lex's world. And if you read the book, you'll see what this lightning does, and it would have been perfect for Lex to have gotten clobbered by it. I kept thinking, oh my, it's a Chekhov's gun, okay? If you you know the, the, the premise of Chekhov's gun, Chekhov's gun is if you have a story and you put a gun on a shelf, and you say there's a gun on the shelf, then at some point in that story, um, you you really need to get that gun and use that gun. And so I'm listening to this story, and, I, and I'm watching what happens as they fight this monster, and it gets hit by lightning, and then another being, a, a Blart, gets, it's not Paul Blart, it's just Blart, because Paul Blart, the, the mall cop, does not make an appearance here. Um, but Blart the Blart, yes, that's his name, um, he, he gets hit by lightning, and things happen. And it happens to their, their enemy as well. And I, I just kept wondering, like, why isn't Lex, like, trying to get hit by lightning? Why isn't he? Um, and, and I kept waiting for it to just happen. Just happen. And it didn't happen. And I was like, oh, oh, Chris, Carney, you are killing me. Chekhov's gun. Chekhov's gun. And, and so I was kind of <laughs> was kind of disappointed to a certain extent because I was really waiting for that to happen. Now, again, I'm kind of going off track here. But but like I said, I don't want to give spoilers because there's a lot that happens in this book. I mean, it's it's how it's 12 hours, you know? How long is it? 12 hours. So, you know, it it really just it, it's it's a, a good length book and it's got a lot happening and I don't want to give away and spoil. Now, the tale just pretty much solidifies my love for Eretz. Um I think he's my favorite character that, that of Carney's bar none. I mean, he's both naive and childlike while semi simultaneously he is the most wise and self-sacrificing member of the group. In total, uh, in toto, uh, there's nobody like more willing to do whatever it takes to help his friends than Erat. And of course, the, the voice that he gives him. Uh, and at first, I was kind of like, "That's the weirdest voice, you know, friend, friend Lex." Um, it's the weirdest voice for him to have, but it fits him so well. And like, I, I just absolutely love it. Like Armin Taylor. That's all I can just say is thumbs up, buddy, because it's great. Um, now, as we go through, we will see that Lex earns his title as leader. Okay? So, you know, there is things that he does that just really carries the story. And you go, good job, Lex. Uh, but the ending is yet another cliffhanger that proves that Carney loves to leave us hanging every time he gets done with the book. I mean, for a great guy, he can be a real SOB sometimes. I mean, seriously. How many times can you make us, like, just wonder? Because, like, these books don't come out week after week. There's months involved. Like, at first off, I worried about Griff. And I can't even tell you, can't even tell them if Griff makes it back or not. If they save Griff. If they stop the Chaos Lords. I can't tell anybody anything. And it hurts. And, and that's that's for your protection, Chris. I'm being really kind. But, but, but you know, I mean, just there's just so many things that happen but that ending, that ending just makes you go, oh my God, where are you going to go with this? And what does it mean? What does it mean? Because there's there, there's implications there that something is off and wrong. But then again, it may not be. Maybe it's just my perceptions. But we'll see. Armin Taylor, like I said before, thumbs up, dude. He continues to prove why he is such a big deal in this industry. Um, Lit RPG is his forte. This is genre, okay? Um, he, he carries the story like Superman holding a little pebble, i.e., period. It's no sweat at all for him. Um, the man is a machine. I mean, he manages to keep his voices straight in spite of what seems like at least 100 characters in his book. At least. And he also manages to infuse them all with pathos and ethos. I mean, there's a lot of that in this in the characters, okay? Honestly, Arat really hits home with me. And his Vaughn, too. So, I mean, like I say, Taylor, he keeps all this straight. He brings back characters that, like Garm um, from Lex's earlier book where he was in the time loop. Um, they come back and, and their voices work. And many the, the the Minotaur and things. There, there's a lot of things that he does. It just makes me say, this guy is, he, he is an A-level narrator. No questions asked. Final score for me is 8.4 stars. 
It's a fun ride, and Carney keeps you anticipating the next book with the way he ends each tale. The monster. That's all I can say. He's a monster, and he just should not do that. And I don't know how many more books are left in this series. I, I think that, that Chris had said like seven or eight. Um, and, and, and again, I compare it all the time to um, one of my other favorite series, which is the uh, Viridian Gate Online. And, and, and the only coincidentally is because Armin Taylor is a narrator there. Um, but, but the stories, you know, they're both compelling. They're both both something you anticipate every time that you, uh, you you get into that book. You just can't wait. And I tell you, um, Carney, he is proving himself to be a massively powerful writer. Uh, I know he's got another book coming out that's not in this series. Shame on him because I really need to have this, I need my fix of the realms. Um, but, and I don't even think it's lit RPG. I think it's like maybe Usha, which is Wuxia. Um, or it's, it's a cultivation or something along those lines. And I, I would like to listen to it, but again, I can't review it because it's not lit RPG. If it is lit RPG, Chris, just hook me up, brother. Okay, anyway, 8.4 stars. You'll really enjoy this book. I love this series. All right, the next book we're going to do is Light Lordy by Brent Tymon, narrated by Christian J. Gilliland, with a book length of 6 hours and 19 minutes. What? I asked as I carefully put my light novel down, perfectly placed on my chest. The image of the woman in an erotic pose might upset my mom, so I sighed as I flipped it over. The woman's barely covered ass was now broadcasted instead, her panties visible. I turned it over again quickly. Are you paying attention? My mom snapped as she crossed her arms. Yep, yep, I said as I swiveled from side to side on my chair. If this was a boss fight, I had to keep a careful eye on her movements. Her posture showed she was agitated, so I had to make sure I dodged out of the way if she attacked me. You are the most insolent child I have ever conceived. Do you mind explaining this? My mom said as she produced a book from somewhere. My eyes bulged as I stared at the cover. Silly Maidens 3! I shouted as I got off my chair. The silliest maidens in the most unlikely of situations. Fujitsu fully rated at 7.9 stars. My mom gave me a scorching look that forced me to sit my ass back down. She sighed as she lowered the book and narrowed her eyes. Light Lordy is a light little RPG. Lit RPG that, that tries really hard to be fluffy and funny. Um, it has a lot of jokes, and if you like anime or manga, um, then this book is really for you, um, especially the manga stuff. I mean, if you, you've been any kind of fan of, of those kind of books and those shows, it's right there, okay, because that's all this guy talks about. This is the way he thinks. Um, he compares his life every second in this game to a manga hero and how he can, you know, proceed to become a better manga hero. Um, the story's pretty simple. Um, a simple guy, Leon, um, who loves manga stories and hot babes, um, the scantilier clad the better, um, ends up getting put into a VR world, virtual reality world, again. Um, he doesn't get killed often and turned to dust like they do in Tuscan Blade. Um, but it actually lets him live out his manga fetish to the nth degree. Um, this dude really hits the jackpot as he is super handsome, overpowered, and up to his neck in the late with the ladies. Now, the, the, the premise is, is that they're in space. Um, he, he is one of those people that kind of gets put into this. Um, and what they do is they get power for things from the people in this VR world. They get powers, their vessels, and things like this. Um, and for some reason, Leon actually is a pretty good person for this need. So they put him in there, and, and he is overpowered. Uh, they, they make him have a couple extra things um, just because, you know. So he, he, he goes out into the world, and he finds out he's got like a, a super shield, and he's got a super blast, and there, there's certain things he has going for him that no one else can touch. Um, so he's got a lot happening, and and that plays into the, the humor of the story. Um, one of the odder moments of the book occurs when Leon goes to a slave auction and buys a celestial being, and she's the one covered on the, the book itself, you know, the book cover. Um, now, now, he is of the light order, which is purity and light and love and goodness and all that stuff. And 
he is probably closest to being one of the most pure beings of light the world's ever seen. Now, most stories would have set it up where he would, like, buy the Celestial and set her free immediately. But that's not how this story goes. Um, and, and I kind of applaud Timon for not doing the expected, but it still seemed a little bit, like, I get that, like, he's got, like, this... I don't want to give away anything, but there's a reason why, no matter what he does, good or bad, for ill or for better, for, for negative or positive, will, will have an effect on him, okay? So it doesn't really matter how he behaves, even though he, he is trying to be a hero. He's trying to be a hero because he wants to be a hero, not because he has to be. I mean, he just wants to be the hero. So it's kind of odd in that aspect of things. And the story is is thus. An evil shadow demon is kind of taking over every city, village, and home it can find and destroying anyone with a light infinity affinity, not infinity, a light affinity, and then they're subject, subjugating the rest. Now, Leon builds like this really big bevy of babes. Not big, there's like four. Um, to help him along the way. Uh, there's there's um, the Celestial, there's, there's a Guilty, there's a uh, daughter of, like, let's just call her, call him the president of the, the, the country, and then there's her guardian, her, her bodyguard, okay, and they're all really cool, tough people in some way, or they have things that goes, go really well for them, um, so he has a lot of help, um, but for the most part, he manages not to use the help that he has for a lot of things. And he doesn't have sex with any of them for the longest time. And I'm not going to confirm or deny if he ever gets some because of spoilers. Um, so, you know, he may or he may not. I don't want to tell you. Um, he also gets engaged to someone and is accidentally given the task to stop this shadow demon. Okay. Uh, and again, I don't want to tell you how things turn out. It, it, you may expect it. You may not. But he ends up having to stop the shadow demon in some way or or shape or form. Now, to me, the book was a lot like putting the lecherous monk Moroku from Inuyasha as the lead of the story. Um, you know, the MC doesn't run around rubbing his ladies' bottoms like Moroku, but he makes it clear that he absolutely lusts for them, and, and there's a lot of times uh, they toss back innuendos between each other. Um, so there's a lot, and that's a lot of the jokes. So if that's your kind of humor, this is right up your alley. Um, the book is just over six hours, six hours long, and honestly, it kind of flies by. Like I listened to it, and it didn't feel like it was it was overly long at all. It, it went through pretty well. Now Christian J. Gilliland does a really nice job narrating. Um, he made the story fun. He he brought Mister Light to life, and he managed to make the MC simultaneously silly and serious. You know, which is really no small feat, um, because you know the MC is so full of crap, um, and, and I don't know if he knows it or not, but he's like, "I'm the hero," and and he says it with such conviction, and you know, and, and Christian does a great job portraying that um, as he goes through, and you know, I, I just have to say that's that's one of those things that it, it would probably be really hard. Like, I don't think I could do that kind of a character because I don't have that in me that that. I'm so full of crap that, you know, I think I'm the greatest thing ever. And, and he does. Like, that, that character, it, he, he just has this, this personality. Like, I can do anything. And, you know, so, you know, the way that Gilliland portrays him is just it's perfect. Um, and his storytelling, I think, is what made the story feel quick. Because I, I know it, it's got a lot of humor in it, but I didn't, like, find myself bursting out laughing. I may have chuckled a few times, but to me, the humor was like a lighter, more fluffy, airy kind of humor. And I, I like humor in all shapes and sizes, but it just didn't really make me go, oh, God, that's like, you know, the, the good guys. Or, oh, man, like Noob Town. That, that, that had me like with feckin' Pumas. You know, the feckin' Pumas made me laugh just time and time again. And I didn't have that, like where I had a belly laugh or a guffaw or a snort. Um, and I just was like, no, oh, that's funny. You know, and... and you can have a moment where you can say, oh, that's funny, and it's funny, but is it, like, burst your gut laughing funny? No. It, it, and, it, like, for me, it wasn't quite super humorous, although I know a lot of people have told me that they found the book to be really, really funny. So, like I say, it's there, and it, to me, it just wasn't, like, the, the turn up to 11 kind of funny. 
it was like maybe the four kind of funny, but it was consistent throughout. And, and Gilliland manages to keep that humor right on par with where it needs to be. You know, like he, he puts it out there and, you know, he makes this book flow because I've had a lot of books, a lot of books that they, they may have been under six hours, but they felt like they were 14 in length. And that was not the case here. Now, my final score is 7.5 stars. It's a decent story. It's well told with, told with good narration. But it feels like we're trotting on really familiar ground here. I mean, I don't think there's anything new. And, and again, that's not bad. Um, because you can tell the same story over with different characters and, and enjoy the story. And like I say, I, I like the MC um, with his, his crazy goofiness. I thought it was it was, it was, it was funny. Um but it just didn't strike me as like, wow, I, I've never seen that before. And I don't know what I will do without seeing it again. So, I mean, I, I will happily read the next book. But like I said, it just, it just felt a little overly too familiar. And it didn't do anything new other than like the slave thing. And even then, you know, it's not really a negative thing for it. So, you know, there's just a lot going on. But it just didn't, didn't wow me the way I was hoping. But it's a good story. All right, so the, the next book I'm going to be doing for you this week uh, is Tuscan Blade. Uh, it's book one of the Exodus Online by Lavelle Jackson, narrated by Alan Adelberg and Annalise Rennie, uh, and it's got a book length of six hours and six minutes. Shadback is probably in the dark hall by now. She was especially upset about the change in leadership. He has always had a big mouth. Hopefully they are going to cut her tongue out. Agronox said hatefully. Necro knew he had to get back there fast. It was time to cut these three punks to shreds. Necro launched toward Glob and swatted him to the left with a shield. The clang pierced his eardrums like an ice pick. Henegar engaged immediately. Necro blocked three slashes from his sword, and Necro kicked him in the knee. The knee cracked and buckled inward, and the orc went down. Necro was set to deliver a killing blow, but Agronok blocked the butcher knife with his sword only inches from Henegar's neck. Agronok's legs swept Necro immediately after he blocked the sword. Necro fell hard on his back. Glob was airborne with both axes held high on his way to sink them in Necro's chest. He was able to move his shield at the last second and block the axe attack. So, on occasion, if you've watched the show, you know sometimes I do my reviews backwards. I flip them around, and I tend to wait until the end to talk about the narration. But in this case, uh, you know, getting to hear a new narrator who does a really good job makes me want to discuss them before the other stuff. I've talked about Lavelle Jackson on the show before, so I don't feel like I'm shortchanging him in the slightest. So, so you know, we're going to just go into the, the audio first. Um, this is a combo of real power. Annelise Rennie is handling all the female voices in Alan Adelberg is tackling the male stuff. And since we're talking about LaVille Jackson here, I am going to make a comparison to his first book, Varnoth. Um, now, in that book, I really lamented the fact that the, the narrator, and I, I won't say his name right out because it's just not right, um, didn't do a kind of a voice for the Catman. I was like wanting some sort of a growly voice or something just to indicate to me that the MC was not human as I listened to the story. Because the MC, Varnoth, is clearly not human, and there was nothing done to differentiate him from being a regular guy compared to an animalistic guy. Um, and I, and I kind of know that the narrator can do it because I've, I've heard Valenqueer, Valenqueer, I think as they say, Valenqueer, the dragon. I've listened to um, the, the audio clips from that, and he does a really good job. I mean, like there's like voices and sound effects and things like that, and I just don't know why that wasn't done there. So, you know, I kind of got let down with that book. Um, Alan, on the other hand, actually gives each orc that is in the book, and this is an orc-centric story, um, a unique voice. So it's not like one voice sounds just like another. You don't hear, I'm an orc. Oh, I'm an orc, too. Oh, I'm an orc. No, I'm an orc. You know, you, you have different voices, different patterns, different cadence. He does a really good job with it, and I, and I really, really enjoyed that. But he still managed to make them sound orcish, which is really important. Like, at no point did I not notice that, like, there were times where um, the MC, um, who thinks in human language and flips into orcish as he speaks, did I, did I not catch the difference? Like the humans all talked one way, and then we get to the orcs, the orcs all talk another. And so it was very clearly obvious 
that he put a lot of effort into making sure that not only were they orcs and they sounded orcish, they also sounded different from one another. Um, you know, like I said, he kept that voice, that human voice on the inside, very viable. So I think he did a great job and even managed, you know, to just, just carry this way better uh, in this capacity than, than previous times that I've seen others others do when it's a non-human. Um, my only issue with Alan is that there's a small little chunk at the audio's beginning where Alan seems to really just kind of blow through things at speed. I mean, like high speed. Um, I, I literally was listening to um, it on my iPad or iPod. I can't tell the difference between these things. Electronics in me were no good. But I go to my iPod and I boop, pop up something because my phone no longer will let me play audio or audible. And so I listened to, you know, this uh, in order to to hear my stories. And I thought I, because I just got this. So, like, I thought I had bumped the, the narration speed. So it went, like, from a 1 to a 1.5 in my head. I was like, man, what did I do? I got to get this down. And I was like, no, it's at regular one-time speed. He's just really kind of moving quickly. Um, but then after there, a certain point, which is not long into the story, he kind of slows down and gets into a regular pace, and, and it's a nice listen. Um, but it just seems to be a bit of an issue at the beginning where I just I was like, holy crap, what, what happened here? But it calmed down and got into a nice flow, steady rhythm, that sort of thing. Now, Annalise, as always, does a great job with the ladies, and she manages to inject the right tone for each woman that Necro has his eye on, whether it's the War Chief's daughter or the Battle Hardened Warrioress. You know, the, these two make a great duo, but, but Annalise really handles the ladies well, and I really appreciate um, that she does that and they stand out between each other. Um, so moving into the story itself, Jackson pens a tale about this suicidal loser um, who jumps off of a bridge and bungles it so badly that not only does he survive, but he also manages to turn himself into a quadriplegic. So now he's in, in the hospital, he's very down and depressed, and he's just not happy with life in general because how much worse could it get? Um, so he makes this deal to be permaloaded uh, into a top-secret virtual reality world in return for letting them pick his race they will overcompensate and make him op so he's all for this now the the problem is is he goes in he never gets out they're gonna they're gonna transfer his whole brain his whole consciousness into that device that world and then they just you know cremate the body and sweep away the ashes and he's never been so you know he, he's in there forever. It's it's a it's a new life, and so now he's an orc forever. Um, and I don't know if I would do that. I don't know if I would have the courage to say, yeah, go ahead and pick the uh, the race that I want to be, just so I have a little bit of extra oomph in my my you know stride and my punches and stuff like that. I don't know if I could do that. So you know, I give I give the MC uh, you know a thumbs up for that thought. Um, and, and, and the op kind of reminds me of the protagonist in The Good Guy, you know, uh, Montana Cogshall, uh, you know, who is like super powerful, strong. He's like Superman, you know, on steroids. Uh, and, and here, Necro is kind of like the same way. He's not quite that level of strength, that level of power, but he's he's got that strength there that lets him get away with a lot of stuff. Now, the, the, ma the main character, Logan, takes the MC name, uh, takes the name Necro Redhammer, and then proceeds to never use a hammer. I don't get it. You know, Necro Red Axe, Necro Red Sword, Necro... Any of those would have fit better, <laughs> but Necro Redhammer just wasn't in the... You know, he even gets like a, a different, like a, a cleaver, Necro Red Cleaver, you know, whatever. It just it just didn't, didn't go... I don't know what happened there, but it was just really weird. It just struck me as, as funny. Um, I but I keyed, I keyed, you know. I <laughs> but it's true, it's true. Um, now the Necro tends to go on these all-out rampages against wrongdoers, um, and he manages to cheese off the wrong people or persons most of the time when he does this. Um, now I I have to say that I wonder if Jackson isn't really planning on maybe placing Varnoth in this particular world. I could see the M2s. The two MCs uh, team up. They're both kind of overpowered in their own ways. They, they both have different skill sets. Um, and and Varnock did wake up with amnesia. He could very easily be a regular player uh, from Logan's world sent to this world 
and then have his mind wiped either accidentally so they build him a backstory or intentionally or it's just one of those little things that happen in the world as he goes through it and so you know i don't know if that's that but i think that would be a good idea i'd like to see necro and varnoff kind of team up and go at it um and then we could also have john son of ray in there somewhere too um just just saying just saying um something to think about labelle Anyway, Necro ends up becoming his clan's only hope and then begins to decimate its numbers as he separates the clan's wheat from the chafe. So yeah, there are some issues that go on in the clan that he you know he has to take care of. So I don't want to spoil stuff, but just let you know, he, he, he goes into this clan and he's happy, but things happen and then there's there's conflict. Uh, now there were a few issues I had with the story, but they were small. Um, First of all, Logan, the MC, is a lifelong loser. I mean, there's no qualms made about that. He says it about 30 times in the first chapter. Um, but he doesn't carry that mentality through the whole book. Now, I mean, I know that if you have a low self-esteem, uh, you kind of carry that no matter what happens. You can be really successful. You'd be like, yeah, I won the lottery, but you know what? Probably tomorrow Wall Street will collapse. Or, yeah, I, you know, I got this really good-looking chick but she's going to dump me first chance she gets. And it becomes like a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy in some ways with people who have low self-esteem. And here, he it's almost as if he switches over to Hulk mode just a little bit too easily. Like, seriously, like, Necro is, like, suddenly really down with, like, talking to the chicks. And he, he's got no fear. He's, he's, well, I'll come back. I'll respawn. I'll do this. But he's, he's super powerful and he knows it. And so he's got no worries. I would have liked to have seen a couple times where he's fighting somebody and he just kind of had a tinge of, man, am I really good enough to do this? Am I am I really the, the savior that I'm meant to be? Am I able to, you know, carry through? Am I able to survive? Am I able to save the clan? That, that sort of stuff, you know, because that would have implied a lot of character growth. And it would have been a development arc that I didn't quite see here. Because, like I said, he goes from, like, zero to hero. I've heard that somewhere before overnight i mean like it's like instantaneous and there's no changes for, you know there's no walking it back after that so that was like one thing i would have liked to have seen him do he, he's suddenly uber confident and overpowered and i would like to see some development the other issue is is that there's really no big bad uh, you know the bad guy doesn't make an appearance until like the final third of the book um, and i would have liked to have seen some scheming and manipulation of necro by the bad guy a little bit before they clashed. I mean, there's there's some things that happen that you can look back and go, okay, I see that that happened now, but that's just the way it is. Um, so I'm sh I'm not sure. You know, you know, I'm not a big fan of slice of life, uh, but for the most part, I think Jackson managed to keep my interest, and he had Necro do some cool things. So final score, I will say eight point eight points. You know, I mean, just eight points. It, it's a good story, um, but I think it, it. Like I said, I would like to see more character growth. Uh, more development with this. And then, you know, like I say, he may want to pull in Varnoff. I don't know what he's going to do at the end of the book, uh, the end of that series, but I could see it happening. I think it would work. Well, thank you all for watching. It means a great deal to me that you are here showing up again this week. Sorry it was a short show, three books, but I really have had no time. Um, again, I've been up since 5 a.m., and it is going on 9.30 right now, and I'm trying to record just so you can have a show tomorrow on Tuesday. It may come out Wednesday. I don't know. Or maybe may be held off until next week. But I'm trying my best to do this for you all. Uh, I haven't had any chance to stop or get this done, so three short, short reviews. Get them in there for you. I hope you appreciate that much. Um, as always, I do appreciate you taking the time to watch or listen to the show. And if you want to support us, you can like the Lit RPG Podcast Facebook page or the YouTube page or just share and like this video. I sincerely hope you've enjoyed the show. So remember, please leave comments. I really do like getting them. And remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. So, you know... There's a lot of options out there to catch us with. There's no excuses. No excuses. Anyway, uh, thank you all for, for watching, listening, and as always, please leave a review for your books. Uh, if you've really enjoyed it, make sure you say that you've enjoyed the book. Uh, it's very important. It's very important uh, to do that for everybody. Again, thank you for all for listening. Take care.